In the next three short videos, we're going to cover some of the most important things you need to know about one of Earth's most dangerous natural hazards, earthquakes. Let's start with a basic rule. Things need energy to make them move. People get their energy to move from food. A bicycle gets energy to move from someone pedaling on it. A wind turbine gets the energy to move from, well, the wind. Yes, that makes sense. As we covered in video one point or three, Earth's crust is made up of huge slabs of rock called tectonic plates, and those plates are moving. They get their energy from convection currents in the mantle underneath them, which keeps them moving slowly over thousands of years. Or it, it would if they didn't keep getting stuck. Let's show you how this works with a little experiment. Here we have two paving slabs, which are going to be our tectonic plates. We're going to use some elastic to make the tectonic plate on top move to the left and the one underneath move to the right. In real life, the closest thing we have to this would be a destructive, also known as convergent, plate boundary. Although, if you imagine you were looking at this from a top-down view, it would also show a conservative or transform plate boundary. As the elastic is pulled tighter, energy continues to build up. It builds and builds until eventually so much energy has been put in that the slabs become unstuck and release all of that stored up energy in one violent jolt. That sudden release of energy when the plates move is an earthquake. I'll admit, the amount of energy released by these concrete slabs isn't very much, but imagine this happening between two of the Earth's huge tectonic plates. When they finally build up enough energy to jolt into motion, it can release a colossal amount of energy. You can't even begin to imagine how much energy a strong earthquake releases, but to try and give you some kind of idea, a magnitude 7 earthquake releases about the same amount of energy as 500,000 tons of TNT exploding. For comparison, the nuclear bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima during World War II released an amount of energy similar to just 15,000 tons of TNT. This means a magnitude 7 earthquake releases the same amount of energy as 30 nuclear bombs going off at once. And as you'll see in our next video, earthquakes get much, much more powerful than magnitude 7. So, when the earthquake happens, and all that stored up energy is released. What comes next? Well, the short answer is waves. Energy likes to travel in waves. When you throw a stone into a pond, you are transferring the energy of that stone into the water, and it sends small waves of energy through the water, which we know as ripples. This might be a little weird when you first hear it, but if you put enough energy into it, the ground can ripple just like water, that energy, of course, comes from the earthquake. Here is a simulation we made to show you what's going on. When the tectonic plates suddenly become unstuck and the earthquake begins, all the stored up energy is released into the ground as it spreads outwards, just like ripples in a pond. If we cut the ground open to show you the exact point where the earthquake is starting, you can see how it's all just waves travelling through the ground. Oh, and there's a name for the starting point of the earthquake by the way, but we'll come back to that in a moment. It's these huge waves of energy traveling through the ground that cause the damage. To us humans, these waves traveling through the ground feel like intense shaking, but the biggest problem is with buildings. Unless they are earthquake resistant, most buildings were designed to stand on ground that is, well, not moving. When these huge waves of energy are traveling through the ground beneath them, weaker buildings can easily crumble and collapse, often injuring or killing the people inside. As crazy as that is to imagine, look at this footage from Nepal earthquake in 2015. You see those buildings right at the end of the street? If you look carefully, they look like they're moving separately to what's going on closer to the camera. That's because those ripples of energy from the earthquake are travelling through the ground towards the camera. Also, 
If we slow this footage right down, take a look at how the people are thrown off balance by the ripples moving through the ground. It's not random at all, they're being thrown side to side by the waves of energy as they pass through the ground beneath their feet. That's why an earthquake makes the ground shake. All of that movement in the ground causes everything on the surface to shake violently. When an earthquake takes place, one of the key things we need to know is where it happened. We call this the epicenter of the earthquake. It literally means the point on the earth's surface directly above where an earthquake happens. The place where the waves of energy ripple outwards from. But hold on a second. What do we mean when we say directly above where the earthquake happens? Well, as we know, earthquakes happen underground but they don't all happen at exactly the same depth. Think about a destructive boundary like the one we've explained before. As the denser tectonic plate subducts underneath the other one, they grind together and get stuck. But they could get stuck here, or here, or basically at a point where the plates are touching each other. This is where we get the term focus, sometimes also known as the hypocenter of the earthquake, but focus works just fine. The focus means the exact point underground where an earthquake takes place. But why do we care how deep the focus of an earthquake is? The answer is, it can actually make a really big difference in how destructive an earthquake is. If the earthquake has a deep focus, meaning it happens quite far underground, the energy from that earthquake spreads out a lot and weakens before reaching the surface. Even extremely strong earthquakes end up not causing a lot of damage if they have a deep focus. As you might expect, shallow focus earthquakes are the opposite. They don't happen very far underground at all, so the concentrated energy released by the earthquake reaches the surface quickly, often causing massive destruction even if the earthquake isn't that strong. Here is an example to demonstrate why focus is so important. In 2002, Afghanistan was hit by two earthquakes, one on March the 3rd, the other on March the 25th. The first earthquake measured in at magnitude 7.4 and killed around 150 people. The second earthquake had a magnitude of 6.1 yet it killed over 1000 people. So why did the weaker second earthquake kill so many more people than the stronger first one? The focus. The first earthquake had a very deep focus, 226 kilometers underground. But the second was a shallow focus earthquake at just 8 kilometers underground. This really shows you how much of a difference an earthquake's focus can make. It's not all about magnitude. So that just about wraps it up for this video. Thank you very much for tuning in and we hope you enjoyed. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and if you wish to be notified when we upload a new video, hit the little bell dinghy. You have been listening to The Mountain Man and watching the work of Michael Deluxe. And remember, keep it simple.